Hello and welcome, I'm Ali Mustafa, and this is Straight Talk. An inside look at a global terror network. We investigate the PKK's links to drug trafficking syndicates in Europe. Plus, we go to Turkey's Aegean coast to see what's behind the recent uptick in refugees fleeing to Greece. The PKK, it's an organization that the United States, Turkey and the European Union call a terror group. And for good reason, it's waged a decades-long campaign of terror against Turkey. After igniting a conflict there in which at least 40,000 people have been killed, many of the PKK's leaders fled abroad, especially to Europe. That's where a recent Europol report says the PKK has set up an operational base for recruiting and financing. Critics say that's because the EU hasn't cracked down hard enough on the group. But countries like Germany are keeping a close eye on the group and say appropriate steps have been taken. Will it be enough to rein in the PKK? Omer Kablan went to Germany to find out. This is Western Germany. And just like in any democratic country, the people here too have a right to protest. So it's not unusual for political rallies like this one to take place. But if you look closely, these demonstrators are supporters of an EU-designated terror group, the PKK. The event was organized by a cultural center known as Navdem. But the signs they are holding make clear where their loyalties lie. Even though the PKK is considered a terrorist organization here in Germany, it's not a rare sight to see their supporters freely make propaganda. In fact, with a police escort for their security. PKK has waged a decades-long battle against the Turkish state and is responsible for the deaths of more than 40,000 Turkish security forces and civilians. I asked a former German police chief if the PKK is considered less of a threat than Daesh. No, it's the same, uh, the same level. So then why is one allowed to protest? and the other not. Both are not allowed to protest. And uh, German police would interfere. A recent report by Europol found that the PKK not only has an active presence in Europe, but that it openly raises funds, promotes propaganda, and may also be running ideological training camps. 3.2 million Turks live in Germany. The president of the youth wing of the largest Turkish NGO in Europe says his group has been targeted by the PKK. Yeah, uh, several of our branches and offices and representations have been attacked with colors, with uh, Molotov cocktails and other threats as well. Journalist Zeki Shahin has been investigating the PKK in Germany for more than 15 years. He says they've become extremely wealthy. 80 to 90 percent of restaurant businesses here are in their hands. Money laundering is in their hands. The illegal drug market is in their hands. I went to speak with Mehmet Shukri Gülmüş, one of the founders of the PKK, who worked closely with its leader, Abdullah Öcalan, who's now imprisoned in Turkey. Gülmüş served more than 10 years in Turkish prisons. He later renounced the group. Europe is the PKK's backyard. It's their source of income. The PKK have an illegal tax system here. They forcefully collect money from Kurdish businessmen and shop owners for the group. If you accidentally found yourself as a small business owner here, you'll be forced to pay this tax. Gülmüş calls Europe a training ground for the PKK. Sis. I got 100% information on this. Do they have camps in Europe? They exploit the democratic law to do this. In Holland and France, they open camps under the facade of sporting camps and behavioral rehabilitation camps. And they get funded for these projects. But these camps are in reality their training camps. Those who escaped from these camps have told me this firsthand. 
Turkey says the EU has allowed PKK activities in Europe to destabilize Turkey. The history has put a strain on Turkish-German relations. Bak artık Türkiye'de barınamıyorlar. Şimdi gidip Berlin'in caddelerinde dolaşıyorlar. Bunlar birbiriyle danışıklı dövüş içerisindeler. Hepsi hikaye. Die PKK ist als terroristische Organisation in Deutschland eingestuft und unsere Innenminister werden auch weiter in Kontakt bleiben über das, was wir in dem Zusammenhang noch an Fragen zu lösen haben. But a member of parliament, Oliver Wittke, told me, Germany is doing its best, given its current challenges. Ich glaube, dass uh, we do not want violence in Germany. When there is a big peaceful demonstration where forbidden symbols are displayed, such as the PKK flag, you will find many authorities saying we tolerate it so that violence does not erupt. After the interview was over, he conceded this. PKK-Gruppen äh, oder Vorfeldorganisationen der PKK in Deutschland Geld sammeln, äh, um den Terror in der Türkei zu finanzieren. Banners supporting the PKK and its wings are officially banned in Germany, but there has been criticism of the law not being enforced enough. Pro-PKK groups like Navdem are lobbying Germany's parliament to loosen the ban. Europe must understand that they will eventually fall into the pit. They're digging. As funding and recruitment operations flourish, largely undisturbed, the question is whether Europe will tackle the PKK at its core. Omar Kablan, Straight Talk. And to discuss this further, I'm joined in the studio by Eva Savelsberg. She's a chairperson of the European Centre for Kurdish Affairs and by Enes Bayrekli. He is an assistant professor at the Turkish German University. He's also the director for European Studies at SETA. Eva, let's begin with you. You've just arrived from Berlin. Give us a sense of, as we saw in the report, of the extent of the PKK's operations, not only in Berlin and Germany, but all across Europe. Well, actually, one must say that uh, the PKK and their um, uh, different organizations are probably um, uh, the most important um, organization, Kurdish organization, in Europe. Th th this is due to the fact, partly, of course, um, uh, that many Kurds from Turkey are living in Germany. I think we have about one million Kurds in uh, Germany and um, uh, only in Berlin around um, uh, 100,000. So um, as the PKK is very strong in Turkey, it's of course also very strong uh, in Germany, where a lot of um, uh, yeah, Kurdish migrants live. Turkey's point of view has been that this is not a Kurdish is issue. This is a PKK issue, an issue that relates to terrorism. And Turkey also says, NS, that European countries haven't cracked down hard enough on the PKK. What are Turkey's expectations from Europe? I think uh, what Turkey expects uh, is a clear <laughs> distinction between the Kurdish Kurds and the PKK. PKK, it is a terrorist organization, and the Kurds are an ethnic group uh, who have different problems in different countries, and all these problems can be solved through political you know, uh, means and the dialogue. And that's what Turkey really expects from its European allies in the first place. The second issue is with the PKK and its activities in Europe. Uh, PKK has a wide network all around Europe. Uh, PKK has its own media uh, um, uh, organs in Europe. It's uh, recruiting uh, militants from Europe, sending them to northern Iraq and the Syria to fight against Turkey. And they are killing Turkish soldiers, Turkish civilians in, in, in <coughs> Turkey, uh, carrying out attacks, suicide attacks in Turkish cities. Uh, and at the same time, uh, PKK is also collecting donations and, uh, uh, uh, and extorting money from the uh, Kurdish businessmen. And all these activities are going on in Europe around in the last 30 years or so, and there was really never a real serious crackdown on these activities. Now, this is exactly what the PKK's co-founder co that we interviewed in Europe in our special report has said. Uh, let's take a look and listen to what the PKK's co-founder says about exactly what you're talking about, Enes. The PKK appointed a person in each city in Europe and said to them, you will receive a monthly contribution from every person under our control. This is the tax. Eva, as we heard uh, from a former member of the PKK living in Germany right now, what is this tax that he's talking about? Is it a protection tax? Well, actually, it's kind of a protection tax, yes. You have to imagine um, uh, that there are a lot of um, uh, businessmen in uh, 
Kurdish businessmen in uh, Berlin, for example, and um, uh, at least once a year, um, uh, someone from the PKK passes by, and um, when this person comes, um, uh, the business businessman, for example, someone um, uh, selling. Um, uh, well, even someone selling vegetables and making money with that, this person already knows what the f person from the PKK wants. And if you're quite successful and make a lot of money, um, uh, this money can be as much as um, uh, 10,000 um, uh, euro just for a year. This doesn't mean that everybody who, who pays this money really supports the PKK. They just know that if they do not pay, the PKK may either boycott um, uh, the shop or um, uh, well, they may they may attack it. So. And it's not like Germany hasn't done enough since 1993. German authorities have banned or disbanded 52 PKK-linked associations in Germany. Uh, pictures of. Abdullah Ojalan, who's the founder of the PKK and the YPG, and YPG logos have also been banned in public since March 2017. So it's not like the Germans and the Europeans aren't doing enough, is it? And as they are doing something, they've identified the problem. So then, uh, but still, there are today uh, more than 200 uh, NGOs operating in Germany which are linked to the PKK. So there are 13,000 sympathizers or militants of the PKK in Germany. And the PKK is collecting, according to German intelligence estimate, uh, uh, I think 14 million euros in Germany. So and that shows us that uh, you know the PKK is, is still active there. And what I see is, I think that the German policy after banning the PKK, there was this undeclared agreement between the PKK and the German state. Unless the PKK carries out uh, terrorist attacks in Germany and kills some person and people. Uh, there won't be. There, there isn't really any any any pressure on PP, PKK, and that's just, the agreement. Just to I add think. to your your point, and the, uh, the the report that came out by the German Internal Intelligence Agency (BFW) and it states that the PKK continues to be able and prepared, if necessary, to v use violence in Germany, at least in isolated cases, or to tolerate acts of violence carried out by its young adherents. Is there some sort of fear in? Uh, in Germany and especially in European intelligence circles that if they go too hard on the PKK that this might become a bigger problem for them. I don't think that fear is the main reason actually but <clears throat> you always have to have in mind that in Germany it's really difficult to ban an association. Huh? If you want to ban an association it's not enough that you have a picture of Öcalan in the office but um, uh, you have to prove that there are e either clear financial links or um, uh, clear organizational links to the PKK. And even though if the journal internal um, uh, service um, uh, says, well, uh, an, an association is close to the PKK, an independent court has to decide if this is the case. And this court might simply say, well, your evidence is not enough. So it's a long process of really banning an association. And uh, this is what it makes really difficult because the PKK has so many people inside Europe that they can, um, if, if, if one association is banned, um, they can um, uh, open another one um, uh, the next Statement. There's a wider context to, to this as well. What's happening in, in Germany, in Europe with PKK affiliates, there's also the YPG in Syria and PKK offshoots in Iraq. Do you think, how do you contextualize all of this? On the one hand, these are known uh, prescribed organizations, terrorist groups operating in Syria, but also fundraising in Europe. So how does that connect? I think we need to see that there is an hypocrisy going on here. I mean, there, is, there are also some uh, NGOs or some mosques who are somehow affiliated to Daesh and also some other terrorist, Islamist terrorist organizations in Europe. And we have seen that the, some European states have cracked down on these, uh, on these NGOs and the mosque. They have closed down the mosque in, in France, uh, for instance, or in Germany. And there are, I think, enough laws that can be applied to the PKK as well. Thank you so much, exactly. Enes and Eva, for coming to the studio. Two years ago, the world was shocked at the sight of a lifeless child washing ashore in Turkey's resort town of Bodrum. Despite the tragedy and others like it, thousands of Syrians escaping war risked it all and made the same perilous journey across the Aegean in search of a better life. An agreement last year between the EU and Turkey regarding the flow of refugees led to a sharp decline in the number of people making it to European shores, but the decline has been short-lived as Aisha Jamal reports. Hiding in the woods in Izmir, these refugees fled Syria and are hoping to cross the Aegean Sea to Greece. 
My kids are so young, they're two and three, and to feed them, I would have to join a militant group. Am I going to fight my own people? In September, the Turkish Coast Guard intercepted the highest number of people trying to travel across the sea this year. Right here is the Turkish coast, and over there is the Greek side. A lot of people hide here in the trees and try to make the five kilometer journey across. But today the sea is a bit rough, and that's quite worrying because if a migrant boat capsizes, the people in it may die within minutes. Since 2015, the Coast Guard has rescued tens of thousands of people. After the EU and Turkey signed a deal in 2016 to stem the flow of refugees into Europe, the number of arrivals dropped by 85 percent. Migrant deaths are also down sharply. With dozens of children and pregnant women in the group, Yasir says they will try to cross just before nightfall. We're here because it's the closest point to Kios. I am going to Greece and I'll see which other European country is willing to receive me and my family. Getting to Greece doesn't ensure resettlement. EU countries made a pledge to relocate asylum seekers from Greece and Italy. But less than 30,000 have been moved so far. And new arrivals, whether from Turkey or other routes, are only adding to the 60,000 people already stranded there. At the same time, Turkey has been hosting over 3 million refugees. They receive free health care and education. But often the services provided to them are lost in translation. Sometimes they don't know their rights. Sometimes they don't know which services are available. Their status in Turkey is temporary. Even if they spend 10 or 15 years in Turkey, if the status is lifted at any point, they would have to go back to their countries. And this scares them a bit. So the refugees opt for Europe, hoping to reunite with their families, many of whom already crossed in 2015. And for those who want to reach Europe, the ending is not always a happy one. Up in the hills of Izmir is a cemetery of the unknown, where hundreds of refugees who have died at sea are buried. Most of them are women and children, and those who have been found together are buried together, with no name, just a number. Aisha Jamal, Straight Talk, Izmir. And to discuss this further, I'm joined in the studio by Selin Onal. She is the UNHCR spokesman here in Turkey. Thank you for joining us. Why are we witnessing an increase in number of people, refugees and economic migrants, trying to cross into Europe from Turkey? Well, it's better to start that uh, this is a global issue, first of all, and we're talking about refugees who are trying to flee for their lives, to save their lives. And in the sixth, seventh year of the crisis in Turkey with the Syria crisis, as you just mentioned, we still see people trying to move, and there should be many reasons for that. What is important is, uh, when we see that people are on the move, we need to ask the basic question, why they are on the move? Because of the lack of legal pathways given to them, they are on the move. No matter how uh, well system they are given in host countries, like in Turkey, for instance, we have a, a legal framework that provides them assistance and uh, services that they can get benefit. Education access, health access, work, legal work for, uh, opportunities. Still, we see some people on the move. This actually shows that these people, no matter how well the system is in the host countries, may have other reasons to move ahead. And no matter how many these are, we will keep seeing this. And I would like to underline the fact that how important is the life saving, like we see in the uh, rescue and uh, search operations done by Turkish Coast Guards in Turkey, like as other uh, Coast Guard operations in other co you know, sea areas and countries, it is important to save lives at first level. We're talking about three million refugees here in Turkey. Of those, 2.7 million are Syrians, but you've also got Iraqi refugees. Turkey says that it is opening up avenues for them, path to citizenship, residency, officiating that. But that's a large number, isn't it? Just to correct the numbers, uh, Tur in Turkey there are over 3 million Syrians registered uh, and some 300 to 400,000 from other countries as refugees in this country. Turkey historically has been you know, offering protection and safety for many, many different nationalities of persons. And uh, this is a fact of uh, responsibility, not only by only con country like Turkey, but it needs to be you know, res uh, shared responsibility. It's a solidarity issue. Yes, they are given a system and help assistance. Whose responsibility? 
governments, countries. Which which which com uh, governments? Which countries? Every country, you know, it's a global responsibility. It's not only uh, Turkey, for instance, with regards to Syria crisis, just because it's neighboring Syria and on the on the other side there's a war and that made you know millions of people displaced and made uh, become a refugee. It's not only Turkey's responsibility to sh shoulder all this, you know, huge work. Your organization, UNHCR, has been on this issue, the refugee crisis, since the beginning. Is there more that the UN could have done? Well, thanks for this question because you gave me the opportunity to once again underline the fact that, yes, we in Turkey try to support the government that is leading the response since the, day, since the first day, day one. It is the government of Turkey with its institutions and ministries help, you know, trying to coordinate the response in different ways because we are talking about women, children, elderly lives. We are talking about not 3.5 million just number, but we are talking about lives spending their days and years in a country, which can turn into many different uh, you know, uh, issues if we don't deal with it. And government of Turkey, with the legal framework, with the social policies provided to them, is handling it very well. It's the kind of a best practice we always underline. Uh, we, what we do as UNHCR in Turkey is that we just support the response of the government. And among the UN agencies, we as UNHCR leading the refugee response of the UN agencies to support the government of Turkey. How, difficult How do we do that is, just to come to your question, we are asking for support and funding and donations from the international community. If you ask me how well we are receiving, uh, we are not receiving well enough. Given the magnitude of the people, given the length of the situation, seventh year, huge numbers, uh, the call that we are asking for international society, community to support us, for us to be able to support the government of Turkey for refugees, not for the So state. how do you get more money? How do you get people we to help you? Exactly. We do have response plans, Syria regional response plans and resilience plans because after the fifth year we also included resilience component in it it's it's not no longer a humanitarian issue it's also a resilience and development issue so we do have this joint plan that we implement together with the other UN agencies governments and uh, humanitarian agencies together we are calling for support after we come up for uh, areas of uh, priorit prioritized areas for support like education what we need for how many people, you know, we have targets and plans, and then we call for support to be able to implement those programs. As I mentioned to you, we are getting, unfortunately, less than half every year, and accord, uh, compared to other countries in the region, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq, Turkey uh, on getting always the lowest um, funding support from the international community. Selim Nunal, thank you so much. <music> Last year's failed coup in Turkey managed to wreck the country's tourism sector. The year also saw airports, football matches and even a public park attack. Then there was a Reyna nightclub attack on New Year's Eve just down the coastline. But after a very difficult 2016, visitors have started to return to Turkey's most popular sites once again. Here's Straight Talk's Adil Halim with a new segment we call Straight Up. Turkey lost more than $9 billion in tourism revenue last year. Yes, billion with a B. But now the country is fighting back. And Turkey is using its fairy tale landscapes, like in Cappadocia, to do so. If you haven't already, you need to put this on your bucket list. Spend a night in a cave hotel. It's 5 a.m. in the heart of Turkey, and another group of tourists are taking flight. Not quite like this, but you get the idea. Mostly this year, it was, they are coming from China. The Chinese people, tourists coming. And South America, Latin America. Last year, it was so bad situation uh, for the whole area, for, for Cappadocia. And, but uh, this year is getting better. The visitors have started to return and spend. Tourism revenue across Turkey spiked to more than $11 billion last quarter. When you consider the first quarter of this year brought in just over $3 billion, there are plenty of reasons for these ice cream magicians to smile. İşte Türkiye'ye gitmeyin, aman Türkiye tehlikelidir falan diye. Türkiye turizmini de doğrudan etkileyecek bir takım yanlış, olumsuz algılar yapılmaya çalışılıyor. 
Biz İslam karşıtlığı ve Türkiye düşmanlığına karşı kültürümüzü ve turizmimizi yumuşak gücün iki önemli enstrümanı olarak kullanacağız. One way is soft serve. These ice cream magicians don't exactly scream Islamic terror, do they? Hey! Even Bollywood's biggest stars can't resist the urge to be pranked. And then there's the deals. So yeah, I'm here just for shopping. Other visitors are drawn to the country's historical landmarks. We've enjoyed every minute of it. So much to see and do. Food is delicious, all the monuments, beautiful. I actually just like this coming along and seeing all the cultures living so harmoniously together. Meanwhile, back in central Turkey, tour operators are hoping for a quick recovery. And if the last few months are any indication, they may soon see more tourists return to this magical place sooner than later. Adil Halim, Straight Talk Cappadocia. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk. With me, Ali Mustafa. Now, if you've got any comments or suggestions, do share them with us at hashtag straight talk. Until next time, take care and goodbye.